So in last week's video, which will be posted right above here, we went over our first impressions of Bitwig and some of the outstanding features that just got me thinking of leaving the Ableton boat and jumping right over into Bitwig. But it's been seven days now and it's not all rainbows and butterflies. So we're gonna start off this video with three things I really miss about Ableton and the workarounds that I've found to deal with them inside of Bitwig. Then we're gonna jump into some actual really cool things inside of Bitwig that still make it outshine Ableton in my opinion. And then to finish off this video, if you're a Bitwig user, please stick around to the end because I have a question. It's actually something really simple and easy to do inside of Ableton, but I, for the life of me, can't figure out how to do it inside of Bitwig. Maybe somebody out there has a suggestion. I would greatly appreciate it if you could help me figure this out because it's driving me nuts. So to start off this video, let's jump into the three things inside of Ableton that I really miss inside of Bitwig. So Ableton over here on the left, let's take a look and it's three primary things. The first one is drum bus. Now I know drum bus is just some compression, saturation, a limiter, and maybe an EQ in there that can boost some frequencies. However, it's extremely convenient. You throw it onto anything and all of a sudden you have a little bit of a boost and gain, you have a little compression, and then you can really dial in your settings nicely and it makes everything really fast and it sounds great. Now, I know there's some alternatives out there like Decap's Knock and then another one I heard of called Slap. I just haven't had time to really test those out and A, B them and see if they're a comparable replacement. So right off the bat, I am missing drum bus. If anybody has any suggestions or maybe a rack out there inside a Bitwig that's comparable, please leave a comment down below. Now, the second thing inside of Ableton that I really miss is the automation. So in Ableton, we can simply select a region that we wanna automate and we can add some predetermined shapes. I can just come in here, select, add a shape. I can tweak the shape around a little bit and it's really snappy and responsive to my movements. Unfortunately, inside of Bitwig, it doesn't work as fluidly. And there is a workaround, but it's a little bit more of a complicated advanced workaround. So over here inside of Bitwig, we have our automation. And I understand that we can come in and draw some things and drag them around. The one thing I have noticed is it does feel a little bit sluggish and less snappy to Ableton. Ableton is just really quick and easy to respond with moving things around and the lines just respond instantly. And then over in Bitwig, it just feels a little less responsive when I'm moving around the dots. I can get the job done. It just takes a little bit more effort, I guess you could say. But the big thing is not being able to draw in and quickly add the shapes. Now I understand inside of Bitwig there are workarounds and the whole environment of Bitwig is based on modulators and infinite possibilities. So if I wanted to, let's say, add a shape similar to this inside of Bitwig, I could come down here and go in and add, let's say, any one of these modulators and the possibilities are endless and I, and I understand that and since I'm brand new only seven days in and still learning how to properly and efficiently use these modulators, I'm sure this will get easier in the future. But if I'm just looking to quickly add a shape to a certain section of automation, having to add a modulator and then open this modulator and have some, have some lines inside of here and then add that to the parameter that I want to adjust, I understand the infinite possibilities of it, but just when I want to do something very basic with a shape right here, um, it does get a little bit frustrating with that. But as I learn the system, I will keep posting updates on if I find easier ways to kind of recreate this easy ability to add shapes inside of Ableton. So I do miss the easy automation inside of Ableton. And along with that, I miss the glue compressor. And maybe it's because I've been using the glue compressor for so long that I know exactly how to dial in the settings to get the sound I want, but I use it on individual instruments, individual tracks, I use it on bus, I use it on groups, and I also use it on the master quite a bit. And compression is one of those things where everything has its different flavor, and if you gravitate towards a certain flavor, it's just your personal preference. Everybody's gonna have their own opinion as far as what compressor they like to use, but I've always just used the glue compressor because 
it is inside of Ableton and it sounds amazing. Unfortunately, the glue compressor isn't available inside of Bitwig, but the glue compressor in Ableton is simply a licensed algorithm from the company Cytomic. Now, Cytomic makes what you could call the original glue compressor. So I went ahead and picked it up from the company for a couple of reasons. First off, when we pull it up, you can see that we have kind of a sexy UI because it, it's more of a graphical interface as opposed to your standard Ableton look. Doesn't really make much of a difference. They sound exactly the same. But there's two features inside of the original glue compressor that I really enjoy now that I have the original version. The first one is the ability to A, B right up top here. So we actually have two versions within the single instance. So on layer A, I can come in and see what it sounds like with this preset, or I can come over to layer B here and I can select this other preset right here, and I can quickly flip in between the two. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll put the same preset on both layers here, and then I'll start tweaking it to have my own version on layer B and I'll go back and forth and just see which one fits the mix better. Also, it really helps too if I'm working with a client, I can do an alternative compression setting and then if they like the other one, I can pull up the session later and then just flip back to it. I don't have to save the preset or remember what I did because both of these layers are within this single instance. Now, another thing inside of the original glue compressor is a second layer of visual feedback. So I think the needle in here actually responds a little bit better than the one inside of Ableton. But if we right click, we actually have a peak indicator. And the third thing inside of the original glue compressor that I didn't even know existed until I read the manual is the ability to change the oversampling. So from what I understand inside of Ableton's version, it's just at a 2x oversampling for both real time and when you're bouncing. However, over here in the original glue, we have the ability to not only change the phase of the compressor, but also what sort of oversampling we have during real time and during rendering. In real time, we have it at 2X, which I keep on there as it's recommended. However, when I'm rendering out, since I have a newer computer, I have power, and when I'm rendering, I have time, I usually crank this up to 32 or 64X. Now it does add a little bit of time, but what you're getting in exchange for that time is a lot more preservation of the higher frequencies and the quality of the higher frequencies in whatever you're compressing, especially when you get into some heavy compression. But this feature right here, the ability to change the oversampling in the original glue compressor really makes it a valuable addition. And I find that I'm actually using the original glue compressor in my Ableton sessions. This is not only for the ability to increase my oversampling when I'm rendering out of a session, but it also goes towards the first main point that has me drawing over to Bitwig, which is the ability to import Ableton projects into Bitwig. Now let's jump into the meat and potatoes and the sexy part of this video, which are the key features inside of Bitwig that I'm discovering that make it kind of outshine Ableton in my opinion. The first one is the ability to actually open up and import Ableton sessions. Now, I've tried this a couple of times and it is definitely not perfect, but it is actually a pretty adequate solution to bring over your Ableton projects. Let's check out a situation inside the computer, a couple of tracks inside of an Ableton project and how well Bitwig is able to import those into a Bitwig session. Now, in order to test out Bitwig's ability to import Ableton projects, here we've set up just a basic project with a couple of key things that we're gonna try and transfer over into Bitwig. On the first track here, we have VST Avenger with some automation on a single macro to see how that transfers over into Bitwig. We have a group right here with some EQ, an auto filter, and a glue compressor. Then we also have a couple of the standard glue compressors that we talked about earlier here. One is a VST and one is an audio unit. I put both of these in here because I know that Bitwig doesn't use audio units. So I wanted to see what it does and how it handles when I have an audio unit inserted onto a channel compared to having a VST inserted onto the channel. Then on the lower one on drums, it's just a simple loop here. We have some third party plugins. We have Decapitator and also my favorite drum bus. And let's take a look and see how Bitwig handles this when we actually import this over into Bitwig. So we've gone ahead and opened up the project inside of Bitwig and let's take a look at how everything transferred over. So first, let's just take a look at the automation here. So within Ableton, we have automation on macro knob number one. 
And as we can see, it pretty much transferred that perfectly over into Bitwig. And now let's take a look at the actual effects that are in the track here. So we have an effects rack with an EQ3, an EQ8, an auto filter, and a glue compressor. Now over in Bitwig, it looks like it's created an effects layer, which I believe it's called in Bitwig. We have layer number one, which seems to be nothing. It looks like it's just the dry track here. And then we have a layer called EQ DJ. Looks like it named that because that's the first effect in the string, but we also have all the other effects as well. So let's take a look at how well this transferred over. Here we have the three band EQ and let's see here, gain low, gain mid, gain high, 16, seven, 12. We have 16, seven and 12. So let's just say that this is a perfect match here. Moving over, we have the EQ eight and then the EQ plus right here. And it looks like it matched the curve exactly. We have the auto filter here set at 2.69. Auto filter here set at 2.69. So the auto filter came over fine. And for the glue compressor, we have just a standard compressor inserted here. And it seems to have matched the settings pretty much as close as possible. We have the threshold matching, the ratio is matching, the attack is pretty close and the release at 200 milliseconds, where over here the release is at 0.6. So let's just say that that's a perfect match there. Now moving over where we had the VST and the audio unit. So the VST seems to have transferred over and let's see if we have a match in the settings. So over here in Ableton, let's take a look right here. And then over here in Bitwig, looks like everything transferred over perfect there. However, if you have audio units, unfortunately, it doesn't look like those transfer over. You can see right here in the lower right that we just have a chain and there is actually nothing inside of this chain. So if you have any audio units inside of your session, inside Ableton, unfortunately, those aren't gonna transfer over. But let's take a look at the next track here. We have Decapitator on the bottom. Here we have Decapitator on the bottom, and I'm guessing it's going to have transferred everything over just fine. So here's our settings in Decapitator, and here's our settings in Decapitator. Yep, perfect match. Pro Q3, here we have Pro Q3, and then pulling it up over here in Bitwig. That seems to be a perfect match, but again, drum bus which is not found inside of bitwig it just basically inserts an empty chain right here with nothing in it so as you can see it's not a perfect solution and i suggest if you plan on bringing over some bigger sessions ableton into bitwig you might just want to go ahead and freeze and flatten a lot of the tracks and essentially bring over sort of a stem project and if you are planning on using some sort of hybrid setup where you're going to be using both ableton and bitwig I'd suggest only using VSTs inside of Ableton and that will make the transfer over into Bitwig a lot easier. So now let's jump into point number two on the list, which is stability. Don't get me wrong, Ableton has made a lot of improvements in the last couple of versions. Now, anytime it ends up quitting, you get a recovery mode and you're able to recover majority of your work. But it's not just recovering the work. What happens a lot of times is if I'm in a session with a lot of people in here and we're working away and there's high spirits and a lot of ideas flying around, then all of a sudden when the DAW just disappears off the screen and crashes and the energy inside the session can change as well. And I've actually had it a couple times where during a tracking session or a creative session working on the track, Ableton has just disappeared off the screen. And then any sort of energy we had going on, whether it's the vocalist tracking in vocals and coming up with ideas, or somebody over here on the piano coming up with some melodies, all of a sudden the mood changes because now we have to pause, wait for the program to restart. They start asking questions of did we lose everything? Is all the work that we just did over the last hour saved? And all of a sudden their mindset goes from the fun creative side to the panic mode of, oh no, did we just lose everything we've worked on? So if there's anything with a program that adds to the stability, I have a little bit more peace of mind when I'm using the program. Now, Bitwig has a feature called sandboxing. So anytime you're using a plug inside of Bitwig, it puts it in its own, let's say, protective wrapper. If that plugin causes an issue, it's gonna allow that plugin to crash within the wrapper and not necessarily take down the whole session. Now, I've been pushing some pretty big sessions over the last week inside of Bitwig, and I've actually had a couple of plugins crash, but I've never actually had a session crash. I just get a little warning asking if I wanna reload the plugin. So to actually get a visual representation of what happens when a plugin crashes inside both of these programs, let's jump back into the computer and take a look at what happens in Ableton and Bitwig when a plugin crashes. 
So here we are inside of Ableton and let's take a look at what happens when the program crashes. So we're working away, we have a session, we're in our creative flow and we have a sound inside of Osiris that we wanna load in. So let's drag it down there and then we get the dreaded live quit unexpectedly. Now I know we can always reopen it and then it does have a pretty good restore feature inside of Ableton where it will scan the automatic backups and it will then ask you if you want to recover your work. And it's not necessarily about possibly losing the work, even though that is a bit of a concern. It's about the energy shift inside of the studio or inside of the session that happens when the program crashes. Now, this may not be a big deal if this happens to you and you know that you can recover your work, but it's more about the actual change in the energy inside of the session if you're working with other people. If you're in a good mood and you're vibing and everybody's throwing around ideas, then all of a sudden when the program crashes and you have to restart, it just completely changes the energy. Some people might get really worked up that they are not sure if the session is going to be able to be recovered. They might lose an idea because now they've shifted focus into the fact that the session crashed and it just completely changes the energy. Sometimes it takes them out of the creative flow and sometimes they don't really feel as comfortable as they did before because they're not sure if the program's gonna crash again. Now let's say we're over here inside of Bitwig and working on another big session and we wanna load that same plugin that we did previously inside of Ableton. Well, here's Osiris, we load it up and instantly we get an error message on the bottom. Could not load the plugin. We have the option to reload the plugin or reload all plugins. And what's going on here is Bitwig is performing a process that they called sandboxing, where essentially every single plugin inside the program has its own protective wrapper around it. So if there's something wrong with that plugin, it's not going to affect the rest of the session. It essentially isolates the issue and gives you a fair warning and doesn't have the program crash. Now, I've been pushing a lot of pretty big sessions over the last week inside of Bitwig, and I've actually gotten quite a few plugins that are a little bit buggy. They're from smaller developers, and I've never actually had Bitwig crash on me. So every time a plugin is loaded that may not be stable or there's an issue with the plugin, I simply get this message at the bottom, and then I have the choice just to delete the plugin. Session stays intact. Now this keeps the energy inside of the session going because people who aren't looking at the screen have no idea what just happened. And also it gives me the peace of mind that the program's not gonna randomly just turn off, disappear from the screen and crash. Now it's not just the sandbox feature inside of Bitwig that gives me more peace of mind about the stability when I'm using the program. Every time I open up Ableton, I get the rainbow wheel to death, some people call it and I know that it will eventually open the session. Now inside of Bitwig, and this may be a small thing, but every time I open a bigger session, I get a little status bar in the upper right that shows that it's loading in all the plugins and it gives me sort of an expectation of how much longer I'm gonna have to wait. And it's little things like that that just give me that extra peace of mind when it comes to stability. Now, again, we're just seven days into using Bitwig and the sessions I'm pushing are pretty big, but I'm sure they'll get bigger. So time will tell if it actually is more stable, but right off the bat, within the first week, I have an impression that it is the more stable of the two programs. Now let's get into the third feature where I feel that Bitwig really does outshine Ableton. And this actually gets me pretty excited because I love nerding out and customizing things. Let's talk about VST mapping and the use of controllers with the program. Now with Ableton, you can go ahead and custom configure a plugin just as you'd like, and you can even take it one step further with adding 16 macros, and then you can map those macros to the parameters and then rename them accordingly. But I've always been curious, is there a better way to do this mapping? And when I opened up Bitwig and jumped into the mapping inside of there, it made me realize that Ableton is falling drastically short as far as the customization on how I can set up all my VST plugins. So let's jump over into the computer and check out the mapping experience in both Ableton and Bitwig and see where Bitwig truly outshines Ableton in the customization of this mapping of our plugins. First, let's go over into Ableton and take a look at the mapping abilities inside of here. For this, we're gonna use a plugin, the Tries AS1 plugin, and this essentially is a plug that controls my external synth, 
but I use it constantly, so I want to have it custom mapped to the knobs on my MIDI controller. So the way we do that in Ableton is we just hit configure down here and start wiggling knobs. And I would probably go through and set up a pre-arrangement of how I want all these knobs in order. Typically, I want to start off with the most efficient way of controlling the sound. So we're going to go with the cutoff one, cutoff two, maybe some resonance in there. And let's actually map out our mixer as well. And as we go through and just keep adding more knobs, what we'd see on a connected controller is essentially a page of eight and then another page of eight until all the controls were mapped out accordingly. One issue that always comes up to me is the fact that I can't have any empty spaces between any of the parameters. So if I wanted to have multiple pages, but only let's say have four parameters on one page, I can't do that here. Now there is one extra step we can take, which is going in and grouping the track and then pulling up the macros. And we can have up to 16 of these macros here. And this does allow us further customization. So by hitting map right here, selecting where we want to place different items, we can actually leave gaps if we want to have, let's say a custom map without one on this to categorize the different parameters. We can also go one step further here and rename all these different parameters. However, once we hit 16 macros, we can't go any further than that. And we can't add any sort of name to the actual pages that these two macro pages are on. Now, this isn't a bad system, but if there's a better way of doing it, I'm gonna prefer and gravitate towards that better way. And this is where I think Bitwig really, really outshines Ableton with its mapping capabilities. We're over here in Bitwig and we're gonna load up that exact same synth. Now, I've actually gone ahead and pre-mapped this. So we're gonna close this off the screen right here and take a look down here at the bottom where we have our mapping. The first thing you're gonna notice is on this very first page, which I've labeled browser, I only have three knobs on top and three knobs on bottom because we have the ability to leave empty spaces inside of Bitwig. So we're gonna pull up the remote control editor panel right here, and we see a couple of new things. We have preset pages and then device pages. So as it says here, device pages are available for all instances of this device. So anytime I load this device, these are the parameters that I'm gonna see. And as you can see, we've gone through already and customized everything and put things inside of specific pages. So the cool thing about mapping inside of Bitwig is one, I can custom name all of these different pages, and then I can also rename any of these parameters down here. But to take it one step further, let's say on this specific preset, we wanted to have access to a couple of knobs that actually weren't on the same page. Well, within this preset, we can just make our own page for this preset or multiple pages for this preset. So if we click plus right here, let's say the first thing I want to see when I open up this preset in particular is the low cut right here. I wanted to follow it up with the attack from the amp envelope. I wanted to add in there, let's say the attack from the filter envelope. I wanted to add in the release. Uh, I wanted to add in, let's say, effect on. And then let's say I wanted to add the ability to change the effect of effect one once I turn it on. And I also wanted to add a little bit of the high cut filter right there. And then I wanted to leave this one empty. So I can make a custom mapping just for this preset. And now that I have those specifics mapped out for this preset, let me go ahead and rename this, let's say, Dirty Bass. And now at the bottom, what we're gonna see is when we load this specific instance of this plugin and this preset, the first thing we have access to is our instant access page, which is made up of whatever we want, but then we still have access to all of the device pages. Now, a reason why this really stands out is that I like to go through my most commonly used soft synths and map them out in a very familiar fashion. So when I'm flipping through pages, I know that two pages in, I'm always gonna have access to my filters. Three pages in are my envelopes. Four pages in is my oscillator one and two. Five pages in is my mixer, so on and so forth. Now, another thing that really pulls me over towards Bitwig is even when the device panel is closed, I still get feedback of what I'm actually controlling. So I have a MIDI controller connected and I'm gonna start turning the knob and instantly at the bottom, I see all those different values that I have mapped out. I'm on the dirty bass page right here, which is that page we set up just for this in particular preset. Then using the button I've assigned to page over on my controller, 
I see that now I'm in the browser. I see all the different settings. There's the nice open gaps that we set up for separation. I can go over into my filters. Without even having the device panel open, I'm able to see everything that I'm controlling down at the bottom, going through all my different pages. It just gives me that feedback that I really enjoy and makes it feel more like an instrument. And even though this is a small thing of having the visual feedback at the bottom of the screen and being able to see what page I'm on and the custom name that I've assigned to every single knob, this just keeps me in that creative state a lot easier and quicker and it takes less guesswork out of what I'm doing with the controller that I have connected. Now, along with the device mapping inside of Bitwig, I'm I'm gonna go ahead and say that the controller mapping inside of Bitwig is actually more powerful than Ableton. And I know that the Push 2 and the Push 3 are amazing pieces of hardware. I had a Push 2 for quite a long time and gratefully enjoyed it. That being said, inside of Bitwig, you can get just as much feature-rich performance as you would a Push 2 in Ableton out of a whole bunch of different controllers. And this is made possible by a gentleman who releases stuff under the name Driven by Moss. Now, he makes a free extension for Bitwig where he has gone through and done some API scripting where it truly unlocks the potential of a bunch of different controllers. So I can use things like my Machine Jam or my MK3, even the Akai Fire right here, to have an experience very similar to using the Push 2 with Ableton. Driven by Moss, completely unlocks the possibilities of these controllers and pretty much makes this into a push to that you can put inside of your backpack. Driven by Moss is completely free and it unlocks the capabilities of so many different devices. But little pro tip, if you plan on trying it with Bitwig, go ahead and print up the manual that he's included with the download. I printed up the specific section for the Akai Fire. I have one for the Machine Jam, and it just gives me a reference guide that I can flip open real quick when I can't remember the specific functionality or the key command that I need to do to perform that function. It is a little bit of a learning curve, but at the end of the day, what we're able to do is take something like the Akai Fire and turn it into an actual music instrument. And Bitwig to me just feels more like a musical instrument as opposed to just a DAW where I'm putting in my ideas. Now in an upcoming future video where we talk about really good deals on cheap audio equipment that can help increase your productivity, I go through the mapping that I created with Driven by Moss for the MPK Mini 3 right here. And it's amazing what you can do with the Driven by Moss software and any sort of connected MIDI controller. I got this guy for 40 bucks and to have something for 40 bucks that I can throw in my backpack, bring with me and perform so many key features inside of Bitwig just makes me more excited to use the program because of that hands-on experience. Now, here we are at the end of the video and if you're a Bitwig user, I'm hoping that someone out there can help me out with this. Now, it's a super easy, simple thing that I do constantly inside of Ableton and I can't figure out why it doesn't work the same inside of Bitwig. So let's jump over into the computer and maybe somebody out there has a suggestion or a solution on this one thing that is driving me nuts inside of Bitwig. So maybe someone out there has a suggestion on how I can solve this frustration. So we have two very similar situations set up inside of Ableton and Bitwig. And a lot of times when I'm working and I have a section here and I just wanna duplicate it out really quickly, I will select it and then I'll just start duplicating and it simply just grabs whatever's below it and then continues to go. It doesn't actually copy over this empty space. So I can just kind of select these two, even if there's a gap in between it, and I can just duplicate it out really quickly. But now let's take a look at how it works inside of Bitwig. So I have the same scenario set up here with these two tracks and this guy over here and I'm working on the fly, I'm moving really quick, and I just want to duplicate this over. And it brings over the empty space and deletes what is right here, as opposed to how it works inside of Ableton where it just picks it up and keeps it going. Now I understand the workaround is either to stop right here and then just option, click and drag these guys over, reselect it, and then start duplicating again. Or another workaround is just moving this track up here but if you have, let's say, a canvas of a bunch of different tracks and there's empty spots all over and you wanna move these big sections and it will bring over and copy those empty spaces and delete whatever was in that place. If anybody has any suggestions on how to avoid it bringing over this empty space in order to preserve what is here on the track when you're doing a large copy and paste and you just wanna add new elements that you added to one section, 
over into another section, but that other section maybe has some additional elements, but you don't want those deleted, please leave a comment down below and let me know if there is some sort of workaround for this kind of scenario. And that being said, if you've made it this far into the video, I greatly appreciate your support. And I'm thinking about taking this concept of Ableton into Bitwig and then also Bitwig back into Ableton into an ongoing series. So people that are interested in working in both of the DAWs can learn how we do things over here, how we can transfer it over in here, and then vice versa. So if you like that kind of thing, please like and subscribe down below. This is Create, Educate, and Inspire. My name is Stu, and like always, thank you for your time, thank you for your attention, and it really doesn't matter what DAW you use as long as you go and make some cool music. Peace.